Let's so have the number two, please. Um, well, why do we have school examinations? Um, a familiar answer falls into two parts. First of all, kind of immediate objectives and then less immediate. The most obvious thing that exams are said to do is to um, provide a public record of how well an entrant understands a subject in depth and in breadth. Um, for instance, we think that a student with a good A grade in geography <coughs> has, has a much better grasp of the subject than someone with a D grade. Now, why is this public record important? Well, um, ac according to the familiar story, uh, it, it, it helps successful entrants to go further in their education, not least at university, and beyond that to gain purpose, uh, uh, um, <laughs> a desirable employment. Um, exam results are also uh, important for other purposes, not least uh, to compare the to compare schools and also these days to compare countries. Now these remarks kind of encapsulate uh, our everyday understanding of what um, s school examinations are for. And at first sight there doesn't seem to be anything um, worth commenting on here, but it all seems to be common sense. Um, but, um, thanks. <laughs> um, if we... Um, look a bit further, it's a bit different, because school exams I don't think are quite what they seem. Um, the more you look into them, the more peculiar they appear to be. Um, take what I just said, uh, I just repeat it, the most obvious thing that public exams are said to do is to provide a public record of how well an entrant understands a subject. In Britain, someone who gets an A grade in geography is thought to have a better understanding in breadth and in depth than someone who gets a D. Now, most of us would go along with this, and in so doing, we draw on our general uh, understanding of what, at a more abstract or general level, examining means. Now, examining, in its most general sense, is an investigation into something. It tries to find out truths about the subject matter in question, and in it tries to do this in a way which is systematic and thorough. Uh, examples of examining in general would be a philosopher's research on utilitarianism. He's examining utilitarianism. Um, a, doctor's, um, a doctor's medical examination of a patient uh, suspected of having gallstones. Um, that would be another example. Uh, there's a whole range of things that can be examined, like um, theories and human bodies, as I've just um, instanced, uh, and also things like, things like the testimony which is given in a law court, uh, the work of an artist, a politician's career, and innumerable other things. Now, it's clear from these um, examples that not all examining is of persons, because you can examine human bodies if you're a doctor. Equally, not all examining of persons is of what they know about something. For instance, um, a clinical psychologist can investigate um, uh, uh, her depressed f um, client's feelings about having HIV. Uh, so there, the, there's an examination of, the, of, the, of, of this person, but it's not knowledge that's being examined, it's feelings in this case. But if we restrict ourselves to examining what people know, um, these needn't only be students, of course, because you, you can um, examine what a prisoner of war knows about enemy troop movements, or you could examine, in a court of law, you could examine a witness about a street robbery. Um, well, there's a problem, I think, with school examinations I I if, we see it if we see them through the lens of examining in general. Um, examining in general is conducting a thorough and systematic investigation into something, looking at it from many angles in order to provide an objective, truthful account of it. Now, are school examinations exams examinations in this general sense? Thank you. Well, from um, what I know about how long um, an examiner normally takes to examine a script. Say, we're talking about an A-level examiner 
um, marking a, looking at a script on um, European history after 1815, say. Uh, but perhaps they take half an hour to do this, perhaps a bit longer, I don't know. It would be very odd, I think, for somebody uh, intent on a thorough and systematic investigation to think that they could do this in such a short time. Um, because if you're going to do this thoroughly and systematically, you've got to find out all sorts of things about the candidate. Uh, remember, you're interested in um, their understanding of European history uh, since 1815. That covers a lot of countries. How far does he or she understand um, things about different countries? Um, how, f how far does she um, um, bring to bear political, cultural, artistic, uh, religious considerations to, to the study? How, how far has she been into um, history before 1815, which is relevant to, uh, to history after 1815? It's, it's a big topic. Um, and um, what this shows, uh, as Andrew Davis in, in this book on your reading list brings out well, is the, the kind of the interconnectedness, the connectedness of, of a person's knowledge about a subject. It's, it's, it, it's not just one thing they know. If, if, if they know about European history um, s since 1815, they have a whole kind of background understanding which they bring to bear on this. Um, now, um, and, and, and also, I mean, um, it, uh, what they bring to bear is partly an, an individual matter, because different individuals will bring different things to bear on it. Um, and they will weight these different considerations differently. I mean, some people who are perhaps interested in, in religion will put more emphasis on religious aspects since 1815 and, and others on political and so on. Um, and in a further thing is that a lot of this background understanding that they have is, is very hard, if not impossible, to articulate. Even by the examiners, the, the examinees themselves, the persons themselves, they can't, they can't spell out what it is they know. That's one reason, I think, why there's likely to be a lot of inter-examiner variability, especially if, if we're talking about exams like history. Um, now, whatever else a conventional examiner is, is doing in reading a script um, on Europe since 1815, they can hardly be said to be thoroughly and systematically investigating the entrance um, understanding of the field. If this had been their intention, um, then they would have taken different and far more time-consuming means to this end. Uh, if they really wanted to find out what this person knew, what would they do? Well, they'd look at, uh, for instance, what books she'd been reading about the topic, um, what she'd written about it in the past. Um, th they might have taken evidence from uh, uh, her teachers um, and other people to throw light on this. Um, uh, they might have interviewed her at, at length and cross-questioned her to see how deep an, her understanding went. So. Um, examining in this general sense of investigation um, does not require exams as we know them. You, you, can, you can examine people and what they know in very different ways. Um, these considerations, I think, suggest that conventional school examiners m may not always be examiners in the general sense. But if they aren't examining, then what are they doing? Well, there seem to be three descriptions, I put them up here, that seem to fit every examiner's work rather better. First of all, like the examiners proper who interrogate um, a prisoner of war about um, enemy troop movements or a witness about a street robbery, school examiners ask questions and assess answers. Uh, it's interesting that there's nothing in the general notion of examining that requires this. Um, uh, it doesn't always involve interrogating people. For instance, the, the, the person you're, you're concerned with may be dead for a start. I mean, t say a historian is interested in, in the history of um, Hitler's regime, for instance, and he wants to know in detail what Hitler knew about collaboration between 
between the Allies and the Russians during the war. Uh, sorry, the, the kind of Western Allies and the, uh, and the Russians during the war. Um, so he's dead. He can't be interrogated. He can't be asked questions. And yet he's, he's, what he knows is being examined. Even where the examinee is alive and where what is at issue is not simply what they know but how profound that knowledge is, um, uh, they don't have to participate in the examination itself. For instance, if you take um, a university search committee, they're looking for somebody uh, to, to teach and research on the American Civil War, say. And they're very interested in, 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 in a certain um, young woman who who's, um, uh, can't actually be present at the, um, at the interview. She, for some reason, she's the other part of the, in the other part of the world and she hasn't got Skype. Or, I don't know, make up a story. She, she just can't be there. So, um, but she has written four prize-winning books on the American Civil War and has her investigating committee are able to read these and see from the quality of these books that she would be an ideal candidate for the job. So here's an example where um, th they're examining her, her work, but she's not actually present at the exam. Um, and all, all this raises the question, I think, if, if, um, if someone wants to thoroughly investigate what a student knows about a subject, are there other, other and better ways of doing this than by calling them up in person to answer questions put to them, i.e. interrogating them? Second point, we, we can also say of uh, conventional ex examinations that they not only interrogate, ask questions, but they also grade. They ass assign scripts a mark. And also they're expected to do this on the basis of criteria laid down by the exam boards but um, whether there's a close relationship between these criteria and the criterion and the criteria of what good understanding is is a further matter. Um, in, in fact, I think there's no logical connection, there's no necessary connection between grading and examining in, in the general sense. Somebody appointed to grades, uh, as an, a conventional examiner to grade scripts, uh, uh, they have to grade them, but this need not entail thoroughly investigating what a person knows. Conversely, um, thoroughly investigating someone's knowledge does not necessarily inv uh, uh, involve grading. Um, I I if in, in, in a war situation you're thoroughly investigating what a prisoner of war is telling you about troop movements, you don't grade him, you say, oh, he's got six out of ten. Uh, so examining, in that sense, d does not necessarily involve grading. In a grading system, I it's assumed that a mark uh, which is given for a script is an objective record, unbiased by an examiner's values. A C mark is a C mark across the country and so on. Um, uh, but um, if a nationwide examination across the country were a full examination of, of what um, candidates understood, e examining in the full sense of a systematic and thorough investigation, if it were that, um, you'd expect all kinds of variation between grades given by different examiners. Leaving aside their own idiosyncratic judgments, even if all examiners shared the same set of values, there's no guarantee that they would weight those values in the same way, put the same emphasis on the same things. And so th there's a problem there of, of variability. The conventional solution, uh, as far as school exams go, I is to um, um, use grading criteria that eliminate, as far as possible, these sources of variability. Uh, um, perhaps this isn't so problematic in parts of science modern languages and mathematics, where there are definite yes or no answers. But elsewhere, it uh, moves towards greater um, examiner consistency, risk sucking the marrow from a content. If, if, you, if, if you tried in history, for instance, to reduce that to yes and no answers, it would take the life out of the subject. So again, we're left with a, a question. If someone wants to thoroughly investigate what a student knows, 
about a subject. Are, are there better ways of doing this than by assigning, by assigning their work a grade? You don't have to do it. What's so good about grading? A third point here is about testing. This is the third thing that conventional examiners do to, with their students, they test. Now, just a word about testing. In, in the practical part of a driving test, for instance, um, the, uh, the examiner uh, finds out whether or not this person can, uh, knows how to drive a car. <coughs> she's not conducting a thorough investigation I in a theoretical sense, so she's not an, an examiner in that sense. But what, what she is doing is um, she's going by perceptual evidence, in other words, what she can see um, ab about how this person can reverse into a space, for instance, or turn into a main road. So she's using her eyes to, to see that. In the same way, if, if we want to test whether or not um, as someone can write their name, what do we do? We look. Um, ride a bicycle, s skate on ice, and so on. We largely go by what we see. Uh, this is true for physical skills like these. Uh, and something similar is true of intellectual skills um, of know-how. If we want to know whether a child can spell, what do we do? We look, again, um, can write in simple sentences. We look, we can see this immediately. We can see from her workings that this child can add and subtract. Uh, and the same goes for some more complex mathematical operations as well as for some translation into and out of a foreign language. Um, testing someone's knowledge isn't confined to know-how with some more f factual knowledge too we can test. F um, for instance, the dates of battles. We can see at a glance whether or not the person's got it right. Um, so conventional exams in some subjects like mother tongue, to some extent, in, in parts of it at least, um, parts of maths, um, parts of foreign languages, and areas of factual recall are often based on testing. Examiners can see at a glance whether or not a student's got something right. Um, and, and this may help to explain why exams in such fields are often popular. Uh, as with the EBAC in this country, for instance, here there's much less chance of um, inter-examiner variability. Um, the the back tends to stress things like mathematics, science, modern languages, the things I've mentioned. There's a sense, I think, in which every conventional examination um, involves testing. And this is via its, its involvement in grading. I've said that it always involves grading. Um, not all forms of testing requ require the setting of a grade, a driving test simply leads to pass or fail. And you aren't graded on it, I don't think. But all grading, at least in school exams, uh, brings with it the notion of testing. If an, ent if an entrant is graded A grade, you can see at a glance that this person's got an A. Um, well, I said earlier that um, school exams as we know them are peculiar things, uh, and that our sense of peculiarity grows the more we study them. I, I think this is because we start from um, probably inchoate assumption that school exams must have something to do with the general idea of examining. We take it on trust that conventional examiners uh, are authoritative figures, that they're in the business of investigating with some thoroughness um, how sound a person's uh, understanding of an area is. But should we accept their authoritativeness authoritativeness so unquestioningly. 50 or 100 years ago in this country, and this will vary from country to country, I guess, but in this country, peop pe and people like bankers, politicians, <coughs> teachers, um, doctors, journalists, academics were all seen as authority figures, and, and of course, um, people in the church as well. They're all seen as authority figures. Now, with a lot of these uh, people like like bankers, politicians, and so on, um, we are much less trusting. Um, we, should we be similarly circumspect about examiners and exam boards? Does the fact that they are interrogators, graders, and testers uh, give us confidence that they're also thorough investigators? 
I say something about this in, in the thing on your reading list um, uh, from 2013. There's, um, I, d I don't know if, if any of you saw The Guardian this morning, um, but um, every Tuesday they have education pages, and they're always interesting. And, and this one is about school inspection. And um, it, it's, it's written by an ex-school inspector, and it raises this question of the authority of school inspectors because it's a blistering attack on the whole notion of school inspection. Um, and um, he, s he says, for instance, to expect a complete stranger to arrive at 8.30 a.m. in a school and make a decision several hours later about whether this school is likely to be outstanding or placed in special measures is plain wrong. Last month, Wilshaw, he's the chief inspector in, 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 uh, in, um, in this country, um, Wilshaw told the Education Select Committee that he could tell how good a school was within half an hour. Personally, I don't think that's the best sort of judgment. So it's a similar sort of argument that I've been using about examinations. H how far can you thoroughly investigate what a person knows in half an hour? How far can you thoroughly investigate how good a school is in half an hour? And I, I recommend it to you. Um, number five, please. Thanks. There's, there's another aspect to examining which I think is, is, is intriguing. Um, so far I've focused on um, examining as uh, con concern with um, uh, examining other people. Um, but what this leaves out is <coughs> Um, the, the examining in the sense of the general sense of a thorough investigation now of one's own mental life, i.e. of self-examination. Now what is self-examination? Well typically self-examination, I'll take this away, it's distracting me. Um, <laughs> self-examination is about exploring one's own thoughts and one's own feelings and one's own behaviour so as to see them for what they are, not clouded by vanity or self-deception. Uh, and there are both secular versions of this and religious versions. Um, non-believers, on, on the secular side, non-believers can often keep track uh, of, of what they think about themselves, if, if they're writing a diary, for instance, or if they're visiting a psychotherapist. But I want to talk more about the religious aspects of self-examination. And you may think this is a bit weird in, in this sort of talk, but I think I'll show you the relevance, I hope. The heyday of self-examination was in a more religious age. And I'm thinking particularly of this country and of other countries um, in Northern Europe and North America. In these countries, it's particularly associated, self-examination is particularly associated with an earnest form of Protestantism from the, from the 16th century onwards. Uh, like the Puritans in this country and in America, for instance. It's understandable that such individuals, uh, and also there may be echoes of this, I don't know, in, 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 in other religions like Islam and Judaism. I'm, 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 um, I wouldn't know about that. Um, but it's understandable that individuals would want to keep track of the state of their souls. Because at the last judgment, the chief examiner, that's God, would grant them entry into paradise or send them to hell. If they couldn't know his decision, they couldn't know what was in God's mind, what would happen to them. Um, but that what they did all try to do was to, to, to keep themselves free from sin so that they would be in his good books, as it were. Now, not that they put their own soul and and the divine soul are in completely separate categories. Because your own soul, uh, on this view, is part of the divine soul. And in examining their own soul, they're coming to understand more about the workings of God's soul. So they're coming to understand vast things about what reality is as such in examining themselves. So the practical m motivation for for engaging in self-examination, the practical, you know, I don't want to go to hell, I want to go to heaven, that motivation is, is also accompanied by another more intrinsic one, 
which is um, uh, concerned with a contemplative reason for understanding the universe as such. Now, self-examination in this context, and this is very important, I think, in, in relation to, to, to our, our own world of exams, self-examination is not primarily about what one knows in this context. It's centrally, in this context, it's centrally about a development in one's moral qualities. Um, it, you, you examine yourself to make sure that you're not falling into sin, that you're leading a good life. Um, but these two are not discrete things, they're not separate things. For Calvinists and other Protestants uh, who believed that they were made in the image of an omniscient God, a God who knows everything, one of the cardinal sins was ignorance. Because you've got to be like God, so you've got to be, and God is omniscient, he knows, he knows everything. So the more you can be God-like and know a, a lot of things, the, the more you can keep free from sin. And the, and the more ignorant you are, the more sinful you are. Um, well, I, I've, I've talked about this in, 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 in the book, um, the 2011 book on, on the history of the curriculum on your list. Um, uh, and I've argued there that the encyclopedic education which was developed by these um, early um, Protestants, that th this idea that, that the ideal education is a knowledge of everything in all the different subjects that there are to know, because um, as I say, this is in line with the idea of keeping yourself free from ignorance and extending your knowledge so that you're more divine, as it were. Um, this encyclopedic idea of education was something new in this country. It was something new because before it was all the classics, Latin and Greek and so on, but the idea that you should have a, a, a broad understanding of everything was, was something new after the, after the 16th century. But it, it, is some, it is partly a forerunner of the standard school curriculum that we know today. Uh, and there's also evidence that school exams as we know them today had their roots in the schools and academies which were run by these Protestant figures. Um, now these early exams um, centred around one's progress as a Christian believer and so were essentially about students' moral qualities. Uh, their intellectual qualities were seen as closely linked to their moral qualities, as I've said. Um, can number six, please? Um, and these exams by others, uh, by other people, were also of a piece with the student's own self-examination. So it, it wasn't really so important whether you examined yourself or other people examined you. And this comes out in Comenius's remark on the board. Comenius was, he was a Protestant, he was a Calvinist, he was also a great educator. He wrote a, a book called The Great Didactic, and this is a quote from that book, that examination is the continual testing of our progress in piety, and it may come from ourselves or from others. Under this head come hum human, devilish, and divine temptations. For men should examine themselves to see if they're faithful to do the will of God, and it's necessary that we should be tested by other men by our friends and by our enemies. Well, there's more to be said about the um, emergence of the exam system which we have today, um, partly from the practices of um, dissenting communities, um, these Protestant communities. Um, but, but that's a historical story, and here um, I I'll um, co co come back to my main theme. Um, I was talking earlier about examining or testing people's knowledge, um, w whether w what they knew factually or what they knew how to do, like ride a bike. Um, I wasn't talking at that point about examining their moral qualities, how good they were as people, their virtues, uh, their behaviour, their personal qualities. But what I've just said, I think, reminds us that examination has, can have to do with these as well. And that in, in Protestant cultures, like in Britain, um, 
uh, Germany, um, the Scandinavian countries, America, where Protestantism had a strong hold, um, this has been an ingredient in, in our educational history. And now, if we put ourselves I in the shoes of these, uh, these God-fearing um, Protestants and their descendants, and as I say, this might apply to other religions too, um, we can imagine their feelings of uncertainty about their worthiness for salvation and the anxiety which this must have caused them. We, n we know uh, that they did their best to allay this anxiety <coughs> by strict adherence to religious principles. And this meant constant vigilance about sinful temptations. Uh, these included neglecting the needs of their eternal soul, these temptations, by relapsing into ignorance, as I said, as well as waste, wasting their God-given time on earth in indolence and amusement. A lifelong regime of examination by oneself and by others in one's religious community was a part of this, uh, a part of this discipline. Now, if we look at school exams today, through the ideas, through the eyes of students taking these exams, we find some commonalities, some links, I think, with these older attitudes. Um, if we want to ex understand the nature of exams as we know them, it's not enough to characterize them in emotion-free terms. They're not emotion-free. For many students, um, exams are not only an assessment of what they know, they're often also sources of acute anxiety. And no doubt this anxiety would be reduced, rather as for the religious people I've mentioned, facing the last judgment, whether they're going to hell or to heaven, um, if less depended on the outcomes of these high stakes exams. This is especially true of uh, exams like the A-level in Britain and of similar pre-university exams in other countries. For instance, in China, the Gao Kao is, is uh, uh, almost a notorious exam in, in the anxiety it produces in, 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 in students for pressure to get into the top universities in China. As young people, and, and other countries too, not just those, India and, and a whole heap of other countries. As young people and their parents often see it, it's their whole future well-being that's at stake here. On the one hand, you get the prospect of three or four enjoyable years at uni, um, followed by an interesting high-status job and a life of affluence, a kind of earthly paradise. On the other, it's a vision of being cast into, into darkness. And it's very difficult, I mean, one can exaggerate this, but it's very difficult not to be seduced, I think, by the parallels with the salvation story, that some people are going to be saved, going to an earthly paradise, or a d earlier it was a... An, an unearthly paradise, um, and um, uh, or, or else um, they're cast into darkness. I think something is also true. Th this parallel with the with the with the past is also true of students' own reaction to their predicament. How can they be reasonably assured of success? It's like the the Puritans, the Protestants, didn't know what God would say about them, whether they would go to heaven or hell. Students don't know whether they're going to get an A grade or an E grade. Um, th 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 they hope for an A, but they don't know. Um, what they can do, though, is to grit their teeth. They can work hard, put their faith in diligence, in industriousness, in unremitting hard work. And you've probably heard of the Puritan work culture, which um, grew up am among the Puritans and has had such an influence on, on our own world today, the idea that life is basically for work and the harder the better. Um, so they set aside, uh, uh, until the exa their exams are behind them, any temptations which they may have to take it easy. These are students today. Now such exams um, are often rightly considered to be uh, um, tests of character as much as of knowledge. Successful entrance to exams, I'm talking about ordinary school exams now, are routinely praised for their ability to manage their fears, for sticking to their goals, for their industriousness and so on. 
Now, um, Nikki Morgan is, 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 is our present Education Minister, Secretary of State for Education, and we've heard a lot of her since she was um, appointed a couple of years to that post. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago to that post. We've heard a lot about um, the importance of character in education, especially the promotion of such qualities as grit and resilience. She doesn't explicitly, I think, uh, relate these to the rigours of school examination and testing, but is this, I wonder, an implicit concern? As you'll see in this quote, we want to ensure that young people leave school with the perseverance to strive to win. We want pupils to revel in the achievement of victory, etc., etc. Et well, a link between um, exams and character isn't new. It's part of the armory of public exams, which was used when they first came to prominence in the early 19th century in this country. Um, and there were a lot of arguments brought forward to support them. And, and one of the arguments brought forward to support them was about the importance of character. Um, but previously, they had a system of patronage whereby rich people gave jobs to people they liked. And, and the new middle classes, crudely speaking, came along and said, no, we can't have this. Uh, we want a fairer system where we have a slice of the cake as well. And that's, uh, in, in a nutshell, um, uh, 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 the origins of the public examinations in the uh, mid-19th century. Um, we look at William Gladstone, a, a famous Prime Minister, uh, who uh, said in 1854, experience at the universities and public schools of this country has shown that in a large majority of cases, the test of open examination is also an effectual test of character. The previous industry and the self-denial that's gone into the preparation are rarely separated from general habits of virtue. Notice the word testing there. He's not talking about testing um, whether or not um, s somebody can add and subtract. It's not seeing at a glance whether somebody can do something. It's testing in, in another and interesting sense. It's, it's, it's testing, putting someone to the test, providing a testing experience. It's linked with the notion of a trial and at the extreme with an ordeal. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's, it's um, um, a test of character, it's a trial of character that he's talking about here. Well, I hope this, this presentation so far has, has shown that exams are more complex than, than, than might be apparent at first sight. Conventional exams have long been seen as more than assessments of knowledge alone. Uh, they're also proving grounds for character. As assessments of knowledge, if we just try to focus on that alone, f uh, they're least problematic perhaps when testing certain, certain skills in mathematics, foreign languages and, s and other subjects, and most lacking perhaps, especially in certain humanities subjects, where what's wanted is a thorough investigation of what a student understands about a topic. And this is related to the question of um, thank you. Um, uh, how far uh, or whether we should continue to use conventional exams? I'll just say a, a few words to conclude ab about this. Um, there are certain problems. First of all, that exams cause personal distress. I've already said um, something about the, exam and the, the anxiety that, that exams can cause, and in some cases it can be disastrous especially in India, but also in Britain. We often read of people with suicidal thoughts caused by exams often leading to self-harm and to actual suicide. Um, I if we leave aside sadists, all of us are committed to the idea that people shouldn't abuse other people. We protect young people against physical and um, um, uh, um, uh, sexual abuse, we support teachers in their opposition to corporal punishment and so on. But I think exam distress seems to be another story. We don't think of it in terms of, the, uh, of those harms that I've just mentioned. It's indeed different, of course, because examiners are not intentionally inflicting harm on other people, uh, on specific individuals too. <coughs> At the same time, they can't be blind to the fact that their system is going to cause a great number of entrants to suffer in different ways. 
well, why then don't we do more as a society to try to eliminate this distress? Why do we tolerate a form of child abuse that in other contexts we condemn? That's the first point. The second point is that exams put constraints on the school curriculum. Um, a lot of later secondary education in this country, as in others, is about exam preparation, and this spills down into the lower parts of the secondary school and, and into the primary school. Um, helps to shape what, what goes on there. This is because, partly because exams and a subject-based curriculum go hand in hand. Exams are structured around school subjects like mathematics and geography and so on, um, and, uh, and the syllabus is um, W which the board set are, are, are within these subjects and the schools follow them. Um, so, um, um, schooling, I think, uh, as, as I've hinted, is based on subjects partly because for over a century and a half um, in, in, in this country, the chief reason, uh, the chief um, raison d'etre of s secondary education has been examination success. I mean, secondary schools um, came on, as we know them, came on stream in this country 150 years ago, around about 1850, um, and gradually kind of became more dominant th than the um, private schools that stuck to a classical curriculum of Greek and Latin. They get this encyclopedic curriculum across a whole range of subjects, all tied to examinations. We've grown so used to exam-dominated schooling that we fail to see what a bizarre way this is of planning a school curriculum. It, it, if you think from scratch, as it were, how would you plan a school curriculum? Well, you start with what schools are for, with its aims. What, what do we want children to learn? What do we want them to become? Do we want them to lead a flourishing life? Do we want uh, to prepare them as workers? Do we want to prepare them as citizens? You ask these sorts of questions. And then you work out more specific aims. Uh, you know, to be a good citizen, you need this and this understanding and, and, and so on. That's a rational way of doing it. And uh, we explore the, I say we, um, my colleague from here, Michael Rice, Professor of Science Education here, and, and I wrote a book a couple of years ago called An Aims-Based Curriculum, it's on your list. And we explain um, how we see uh, 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 the proper way of planning a school curriculum. Um, but at the moment, there's a kind of stranglehold of the exams on the school curriculum. And if that were removed, it would free schools, uh, not only from the unimaginative and, for many people, s boring syllabuses that um, ex the exam regime often brings with them, um, it, it, it would leave schools freer to devise courses and activities which are likely to be appealing to young people as well as educationally, f educationally valuable, as, as well as teaching within subjects, and I, I have nothing against that, <coughs> against teaching within a subject, why not? But uh, well, what I am against is the idea that this should be the only thing. As well as doing that, they could encourage interdisciplinary work of all sorts, projects, themes, <coughs> sorts of things which we are used to in good old-fashioned primary education, for instance. And also, these can be things on which stu students can learn with commitment and enthusiasm, and also, and this is an important point, collaboratively. So that's another point, collaboratively about the examination system seen in terms of its history in this country. Um, the, pr the Protestant revolution in this country, to go back to that, what was it? It was the idea that the individual is in direct touch with God. There's no hierarchy of priests and popes between you and God. You're in direct touch with God. So there's a, a tremendous emphasis on the individual, the the, the importance of the individual within Protestant cultures. And I've got a lot to be said for, uh, uh, I've got a lot to say for individ uh, this emphasis on, on individuals. There's a lot to be said for it, but it shouldn't go too far. And I think it's affected the school system in that we think of, of, of schools as, as teaching, uh, traditionally we've thought of them until 
rather recently actually, as teaching individuals sitting behind desks, of examining individuals for what the individual knows. And there's been m much less emphasis until recently on collaboration. Um, well, the years of adolescence are currently um, tamed b by um, the discipline of public examinations and energies and enthusiasms that could have been deployed elsewhere are funneled into hard work, Puritan work culture work, for the GCSE and A-level exams. F that's for some people, for other people they just get turned off, they become disaffected. Freed from exams, schools could do so much more, I think, to create activities that engage young people, lead them into new territories of thought and feeling, and leave them at the end of their school career with a passion to keep on learning and how wonderful that would be. I have number 10, 11. Um, uh, I expect you've seen this, have you? Have you seen this one? Um, well, the third point about problems I I is that exams uh, encourage undesirable traits in teachers, like teaching to the test, and in students, like an over-instrumental attitude to learning, you're learning for the sake of the exam rather than for its own sake, and in some cases cheating. And this is an example from Bihar in India where um, there's an exam hall and the people inside are busily scribbling away and various friends and relatives are climbing up and pushing things through the windows for them. So that's the problem. Here's the solution, by the way. This is the next slide, also from Bihar. L last week, um, if you, this is an army exam, if you strip people down to their underpants, put them in a field, um, how can they possibly <laughs> cheat? <laughs> so they hope, anyway. Um, well, that's the, th the third problem. The fourth problem, I think, I I is simply that the, the, the t amount of time and energy and expense that schools put into examinations, if you think about it. Who's it for? It's not is much less for their benefit than for the benefit of, of other institutions like universities and, exam and, and, and employers. So why not involve them, you know, if they want to s sort out who they want to have at their universities or, or to employ, why should schools be mm, k kind of um, put upon, as it were, to spend so much of their energy and time, as say, in preparing people for exams? Um, Lastly, it's also been claimed that a main function of uh, conventional school exams is to preserve a, a certain kind of social structure, a hierarchical structure in which elites continue from one generation to the next. I think we're familiar with this argument, not only in this country, but in places again like China and Japan and uh, India and America and other countries. Um, we could have the next one. Again, coming back to my friend Gladstone, our old Prime Minister, he, he told Lord John Russell that in open competition, the upper class would, on the average, prove superior to the rest of the nation, uh, and that the time had come to give a new and striking sign of rational confidence in the intelligence and confidence of the people. Uh, and you might ask, um, well, I, I've also just written um, a, a, a book on private schooling in this country, and, 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 and that private school pupils often, often do rather well in examinations. And there's a question mark over uh, th this, um, this claim, at least, that one rationale for the examination system is so that elites can be preserved from one generation to the next. If, if, if um, um, uh, you know, better off people are able to employ private tutors and, and, and so on, or send people to private schools and so on, they, they have a better position, they have a, they're much better placed in the examination stakes and so can continue into the next generation. Um, how much truth there is in that argument, I don't know, but I'll leave it to you. Um, well, in this talk, I, I've talked mainly about conceptual problems about exams, what exams are, with a few remarks about um, problems, psychological problems and others. There are also questions about alternatives, and we have the last, thank you, Mary, uh, about what alternatives there might be to conventional exams. Uh, uh, for instance, about graded tests. Thirty years ago, um, a, um, a philosopher of education uh, called Mary Warnock, who's now in the Lords here, 
um, gave a talk at this institute on graded tests as an alternative to examination. She's very keen on the idea of graded tests. And at that time, there was a lot of thought 30 years ago about alternatives. Another alternative which can be combined with a graded test was um, a record of achievement that uh, carries on throughout a school. Um, uh, people like Tim Brighouse these days are talking about school-based exams rather than external exams, for instance. What about the use of lotteries um, to, um, as, uh, to select people for universities and, and for jobs? You know, given that you have a thousand candidates, all of whom look marvellous from their records, um, can't choose between them. Well, why not just have a lottery? It's pretty fair, isn't it? Um, well, anyway, if, if, um, if you want to ask me questions about um, um, problems of exams or alternatives to exams, as well as what exams are, please feel free to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Who would uh, like to uh, ask something first? It might be that you... Don't, don't feel afraid, honestly, John's <laughs> lovely. <laughs> um, it might be that you just want something clarified, so you might just want to say, could you just say a little bit more about X or Y, or could you just explain this again? That's absolutely <coughs> fine too. These are not easy concepts, you know, because up to now the course has been quite technical in looking at the examining <coughs> system and testing system from a different perspective. So yeah, Liam, thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, could you possibly just say a little bit more about graded tests and yes. how they differ from examinations or um, Yeah, I'm not. I should should say I'm not an expert on on, on the graded tests. I've just uh, particularly lit up by this book, which I found wow. in my with my own books, and it's in it's, it's in the school library, the one by Mary Warnock. But um, if you think of the um, uh, if you think of music exams, for instance, if, if people are learning the piano uh, and, and, the, uh, and, and they go through grade one, grade two, grade three, and so on, that would be an example of a graded test. And, and um, Mary Warnock's idea is, is that you can extend the Id uh, this idea of the graded test from th things like music exams through, through to other subjects, through to, th through to mathematics. You can you know, reach a certain kind of le uh, level and then move on to the next. Um, and um, how far they can apply, though, to the whole spectrum uh, of examinations is, is a further question. I think it becomes harder, ag again, as you move from, from things like um, uh, um, skills like um, music or physical skills, like Perhaps gymnastics might be another example, for instance. If you, if you move from the area of, of, of skills, both physical and intellectual, um, like arithmetic, I into um, areas like the humanities, I'm not sure uh, how graded tests would work in, in the case of history and geography. And it's, it's interesting that in, 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 this, in this book that most of her examples are drawn from things like modern languages um, uh, and uh, mathematics and science uh, rather than from the humanities but um, um, I'd, I'd, I'd be very keen to know more actually but uh, that's that's about the limit of what I do now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know if you could please clarify a little bit more about um, I was very intrigued about schools being freed from examinations and if you could just clarify a little bit more about what you mean by free. Free or freedom from examinations. Free from exams. Well, um, there's like an ideal blue skies position, and then there's a kind of re more realistic positions, I guess. Uh, and the the ideal blue skies position would be if um, you didn't have um, conventional exams as we know them at all, and, and you had something in their place. I mean, perhaps perhaps records of achievement of some sort, um, uh, whereby, um, um, I mean, in, in the 80s, when records of achievement were, in uh, uh, the 70s and 80s, that was the heyday of um, 
uh, in, for instance, London Comprehensive Schools uh, of uh, experimentation with records of achievement, the idea that you could build up a cumulative record of, of achievements that the child has in, in all sorts of things, including graded tests, their kind of music uh, abilities and so on, but also in, in, in um, um, I mean, you can feed into that th their exam results. You, you can f <coughs> feed into it um, um, if, if, if this is manageable, um, uh, uh, some kind of story of their progress as persons and their personal qualities. Um, these days, uh, you have um, m much more at your um, uh, uh, disposal, I guess, I I I in, in the shape of the web. And there, there are primary schools which, which, which use kind of um, um, web um, techniques to involve parents and students, them s uh, you know, primary kids from the age of five upwards, uh, as well as teachers and others, in, in building up a, a, a cumulative picture of, of how this child is doing. So um, that might be some sort of ideal, but um, in, in terms of realism, um, the problem um, realistically speaking, as, as we all know, there are huge, huge vested interests in favour of the present system. I, I mean, coming from um, the, the, the exam boards, for instance, um, from teachers themselves who've been used to working within a, a, a system, not least from parents who want their children naturally to do well and, and see the route to doing well as what else is there? There's just the exam route um, to politicians and others. There's a huge vested interest in the examination system in every country in the world, I guess, and that makes it um, pretty well immovable. But can something be done to, to mitigate it? I mean, are, are there things which you can do? I say, um, Tim Brighouse, um, um, uh, um, who used used to be um, uh, c concerned particularly with London schools and getting c collaboration um, among them uh, to improve them. Uh, he um, is very much in favour of school-based exams. I mean, why do we, I I if, 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 ex ex if we need exams, do they have to be external exams? Do they have to be set by external exam boards? Why not s schools setting their own exams, which are somehow moderated so as to ensure some kind of fairness and so on? Uh, you can explore that sort of idea as well. But um, I don't think there's any... Uh, I think the idea that we could just get rid of exams is, is really a pipe dream because of all the, all the powers, the power that's stacked up against... Uh, in, in, in favour of them, really. Um, in conventional examinations. Um, well, um, I, um, I come from a from a humanities um, background, uh, and um, I have a degree in history and a degree in philosophy, and so that's where my kind of um, um, understanding is, and I've taught those two subjects as well. Um, and there, there, I think there are very definitely the sorts of problems that, 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 that I mention. Um, how far they extend to, to, to something like um, mathematics or physics, um, I, I don't know. Um, um, now whether there's any, any value in exams, well, it depends on your on your point of view and what sort of things you you count as valuable if um, if um, one counts as valuable su success in in life in the conventional sense in other words getting a good job a good income a nice house a nice family and all the rest of it this earthly paradise idea then um, perhaps in, in our present world 
Um, there is value in exams because it's, 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 it's a surefire route to those things. Um, uh, y you might also be of a Nicky Morgan-like persuasion, for instance. I mean, you might also think that it's important that people have resilience and grit, and these should be encouraged in schools, and perhaps working hard for examinations can be a way of, pr of promoting these. So I think um, it must depend on, 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 your, va on your value system, um, what value, you know, whether or not you can see any value in exams, and perhaps you can, and perhaps you can't. Depends on that, I think. Oh, thank you. This one, the first one here is, um, did you ever try to resist examinations of <laughs> any kind? If not, how did you persuade yourself that the test does not cause distress? Um, well, I, if, you, if you're talking about me personally, mm. me personally, um, no, I mean, when I was young, I never resisted any exam. I loved them. I was terribly good at them. And, and um, I lived for examinations, and I always wanted to become top in the class and all that sort of thing. So um, I, I don't think I've ever resisted any kind of exam. No, I don't think so. <laughs> What's the next one? So the next uh, one was, um, as a counter-proposal to public examinations, it's been proposed that educational and employment bodies could set their own exams, not relying on schools to do so. Or they could rely on other data about entrance than those supplied by exams, such as student profiles. But how do we ensure that student profiles or student attainments are valid and reliable? Yeah, this is, this is a big a big question and I'm not sure that I have um, uh, a, a, again a, a, um, a, a surefire ans answer to this but um, it seems to me that it's that um, rather than just ruling them out of hand saying well how could they ever be reliable because they're all based on local local factors uh, on, on teachers views and teachers can vary from one school to another. Some teachers may favor certain pupils and so on. Um, how, how, how can we ever think of, of, of an objective system? Well, I think um, one thing to bear in mind, if, if we're thinking of, uh, of examining proper, as, uh, uh, as I call it, of, of, of a thorough investigation of what somebody understands, for instance, then um, it, it follows from what I was saying earlier that a, a person who's a complete stranger, who, who's, who's just um, a person marking an exam paper, for instance, is not in a good position to examine a person in, in, in the more general sense. Um, because that person doesn't have the understanding the, uh, of uh, the, uh, doesn't have the, the understanding of the understanding, doesn't have the understanding of the student's background understanding that uh, I've claimed is essential. Now, who has that background understanding? Well, uh, if anyone has it, it's going to be people who are in close touch with the student on a daily basis. And so you'd expect teachers um, and parents and others uh, who are closely in touch with a student to, to have, to, to, to be the only people really to to be able really to, to assess in some depth what that person understands in, sub de in, in, in some depth. Um, now, um, I, I see that as, uh, if, if you start from there, th then you have um, a problem of working out a system which uh, can reflect that. And um, um, as I said, I don't have any kind of surefire answer t to what it is. All I do say is, I is that at least that's where we should start. Um, we shouldn't s sort of rule it out of court and say, oh, oh well, it, 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 there's ov obvious problems of um, lack of objectivity and so on, and variability, so we'll stick with the present system. 
there's another argument for saying, well, let's examine this system where um, local knowledge of the student is going to be much more prominent in, in, the, in the assessment system. Um, and uh, as it is in formative assessment in schools, so I'm thinking of how it could be incorporated into, in, into something more summative. Um, and find ways of coping with the problems of um, subjectivity and, and variability as, as they come up. I mean, perhaps we can do something about um, uh, teacher training, for instance, uh, ab about tr trying to, uh, uh, perhaps more broadly than teacher training, s s somehow to kind of um, get it um, established in the public's view rightly that teachers are people that can be trusted, uh, th that, that, that they won't um, be people who favour this child or that child, that they can be trusted to give an objective account of, of things. So that's one thing w that one might try. One might try um, um, s some kind of um, um, comparison between schools and systems, for instance, just to make sure that there aren't kind of vast discrepancies between the sorts of judgments that are being made. Why not try that sort of route? I, I'm not sure where it would lead, and I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, but I don't see why we should automatically rule it out. That's, I suppose, what I'm saying. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry. More questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I'm going to do actually is come on to this one here because I think this is quite interesting. I'm going to come on to this one here uh -huh. because it's quite interesting in a sort of a, in a in a philosophical way actually. Um, our exams and um, <coughs> the process of study for examinations not also preparation for life. For example, one argument is that examinations cause distress and anxiety not being selected for a job or university after interview also causes personal distress and having surgery causes anxiety. How is this different? Yeah, um, <laughs> good question. It's a very good question. If you give me about half an hour just to <laughs> <laughs> give an answer. Um, this is what philosophy says. Well, I suppose the the argument here is that um, um, distress and anxiety are a part of life um, that we sh we just just put up with them, and we can see examinations as a, a, a preparation for life because they um, uh, allow people to. They enable people to cope with anxiety and stress. Um, well, this is, I, I suppose, something like the Nicky Morgan position, isn't it? That, that um, what's important to develop is resilience and grit, that sort of argument that, um, OK, anxiety is going to be inevitable, stress is going to be inevitable, but what you need is something to counteract them, some power of character which will enable you to win through. Um, uh, I, can see, I, I can see that that makes some kind of sense. On the other hand, um, if, if there is anxiety and pain, um, is it in life? Uh, sh should, should, should we take the line, first of all, that is just part of life and we should just put up with it? Um, if we think that um, um, what's important in human life is, is people's flourishing, people's leading a life of well-being of some sort, then a life of well-being um, which is full of anxiety, uh, sorry, a life which is, is going to be f uh, plagued with anxiety and stress it's going to be less flourishing, it's going to be less of a good life than a, than a life which um, lacks these things. So, um, at, at least for many people, I mean, the, there are um, qualifications which I think one should make to that, but, but in general, um, 
why is pain such a good thing? Why not, why not uh, rely something, uh, to some extent on the utilitarian position that, uh, that what's important is the reduction of pain and the promotion of happiness or well-being? Uh, and okay, surgery, um, ha having surgery causes anxiety, but we, we don't say, okay, you've got an operation tomorrow. Yeah, it's, it's tough. We, we do things to allay people's anxiety, to remove the pain uh, that, 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 that otherwise they might feel. So I, I think I would take that sort of line to that sort of question, I think. I'm sorry, yes. do, you, do you think that some people may see that as a rite of passage that students have to go through a, a certain amount of torture, if you will? Um, it, you know, it was good for me and I came out okay, so it's good for you too. Yes, um, <laughs> I didn't suffer. I, I, I'm sure that's right, yes, and um, I guess um, you, you sound as though you're from kind of a North American uh, um, part of the world, um, and I guess in North America and other Protestant uh, countries with Protestant roots, that sort of attitude is 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 a familiar one. I think you know, it was all right for me. I didn't mind being kind of um, corporal punishment when I was a kid. It hasn't done me no harm, and so on. Um, and um, the idea of a rite of passage goes with this idea of life as a struggle through a veil of tears, where you've got to kind of work hard to kind of keep on the straight and narrow. And um, I don't see why we should, you know, unless we are devout Protestants and we, um, we buy the whole thing. Um, I don't see why we should buy that at all. I mean, why should we think of life like that? Why should we think of life as, as, as having to have these, these terrible rites of passage? Um, why don't we think in, instead of, okay, there is a problem. Um, 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 a thousand young men want a job in the Indian Army. We, we have a problem of selecting them. Um, let's try and solve that problem rather than, let's, let's try and solve it in a humane way, uh, rather than just assuming that, that a tough, a tough-minded way is necessarily the best. Okay, well, on that note, it is um, ten to seven, so I think it's time for us to stop. I did promise John awesome to stay here online <laughs> under trial. <laughs> um, so I hope that you have uh, found this very interesting to hear someone talk about testing it from a completely different perspective. Um, and can we all thank John again for 